He took care of everything for me. I was able to keep all my doctors and my same pharmacy down the street. Call Debbie at I Will Advisors, 954-753-8080, 954-753-8080. People are learning in a classroom how money is made from home at Online Trading Academy. Just how much? A hundred, two hundred, three hundred. They were able to get to five hundred dollars a day in a little over eight months. Five hundred a day, folks, is ten thousand a month. Get classroom instruction on how money can be made from home and how risk is limited. Learn stocks, options, futures, forex. Learn step by step from professional traders at Online Trading Academy. Everyone starts off very small baby steps. You know, if you can't average a hundred dollars a day. There's no way you're going to be able to make $300 a day or $3,000 a day in the markets. Thousands have learned how money can be made from home with limited risk at Online Trading Academy. Attend a free half-day class to see how it works in Broward and Palm Beach. Online Trading Academy. Call now. 561-674-9800. 561-674-9800. 561-674-9800. That's 561-674-9800. Talk here. <laughs> Talk there. Talk 1470 AM and 95.3 FM. The Health and Wealth Radio Network. WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Ant2.tv presents You and Your Doctor, teaching you to live a longer and healthier life. Proudly sponsored by All County Healthcare, where people are the heart of our business. All County Healthcare is a Medicare certified agency where one call will service all your home care health needs. For more information, call 954 717 7027 or visit our website, allcountyhealthcare.com. Now, let's get informed to living a longer and healthier life. Here is your host for today's show. Hi, welcome to You and Your Doctor, where we're teaching you how to live a longer and healthier life. I would just like to say at this moment that we're sending prayers and thoughts out to our friends in all the Texas areas that were hit so badly by the Hurricane Harvey. We are keeping you in our our prayers. We're sending you uh, lots of energy and love and also donations. So our, our thoughts were with you. We are being presented by AMP2 TV and proudly sponsored by All County Healthcare, a Medicare certified home health agency, where we also are teaching how to live a longer and healthier life, where patients are the heart of their business as well. So, we are streaming live right now on 1470 AM and 95.3 FM, and we're also on All County Healthcare Facebook fan page, so you can follow us there live. We're also on Amp2 TV and YouTube, so welcome. It's great to have you here this evening. We're here every Tuesday between the hours of 6 and 7. So if you have any questions whatsoever for our doctors this evening, please give us a call at 888-565-1470. Or if you have any questions for any of the doctors and or All County Healthcare, please give Maddie a call at 888-717-717. 7170. She would love to answer any of your questions for you or get you in touch with any of our doctors. We also have the past shows that we have done archived on allcountyhealthcare.com. So take a peek on there. We have the experts here. So it is with great Great pleasure that I introduce you to our next doctor. And I was told that he is an absolute expert in his field. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Eric Beyer. Thank you. And you are a cardiothoracic surgeon. That is correct. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Now, I was told he is the best in the field. Am I correct in that? Well, you know, uh, we get very, very good results and we're focused on uh, patient safety and the results. So. I'm very proud of the results that we achieve at uh, Florida Medical Center. So, yeah. That is wonderful. Thank that you. is wonderful. And I, and I love Florida Medical Center. That is a great hospital. I'm very familiar with it. Thank you. 
Yeah. So one of the things that I'd like to ask is what what made you decide to go into this particular field or just being a doctor? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I, you know, ever since I could remember, I have told my uh, parents that I wanted to be a doctor. So it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly where that um, came from. Uh, uh, but I do remember, you know, very early on in, in life, you know, going to the library and, you know, back when you could check out books and stuff, <laughs> you know, going there and looking at, at, at uh, you know, all the different types of uh, pathology books and doctor books. And uh, yeah. I was always very interested in it. I don't That's know why exactly. Amazing. Yeah, my mom always tells me that. I said that from a very early age. So. Wow. Yeah. So what made you decide to go into this particular direction? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question, too. You know, in medical school, you know, once, once uh, I... I was in medical school, I had the opportunity to be exposed to uh, surgery, mm -hmm. and uh, I was exposed to pediatric uh, surgery uh, while I was there. There was a nice surgeon that took me in uh, when I was, uh, you know, my second year of training, and, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with him, and uh, I thought, you know, this surgery is kind of, a, kind of my thing. And uh, then I did a general surgery residency in Houston, uh, and, oh, and I want to reiterate what you what you said. You know, our prayers mm -hmm. go out to them. Yes, I still absolutely. have a lot of friends there. You know, I lived there for uh, ten years, and uh, and uh, you know, two of my daughters were born uh, there at the medical center. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a big deal. And, uh, you wow. know, all those pictures, you know, I know all those places that they're showing, it's terrible. But mm. having said that, I did train in Houston. It was a great uh, medical center there. Uh, and I did my general surgery and I was exposed to open heart surgery while, while in training for general surgery. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, I like this a lot. And, uh, -huh. uh so, um, I, I went on to the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, trained there to become an open heart surgeon, and so that's kind of that's kind of my history wow. on that. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know something, and I also know the Florida Medical Center has really amped up their uh, cardio uh, department. That's where right. They're, 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 it's amazing some of the things that they are doing that's, when that's it comes exactly to the right. heart. Yeah, we have a uh, hybrid operating room where we work closely with cardiologists doing doing combined procedures. Uh, mm. They just opened up an electrophysiology lab uh, that's state-of-the-art uh, wow. for Broward County. And um, so, you know, we have uh, great electrophysiologists. I think you've probably met a, a couple of them along the way, um, like Dr. Kenningsberg and Dr. Nyeri. And they... Uh, they, uh, they're, they've just, they're such a joy to work with, a pleasure mm. to work with. It's nice having that nice collaborative approach with the, with the cardiologist uh, that I, I get to work with. So yeah, no, it's been exciting. You know, Brow uh, Florida Medical Center was the first hospital in Broward County to do open heart surgery, and uh, wow. and so I think we we uh, you know we kind of respect that tradition, and uh, we're trying to get back on top of things and, and be the number one uh, place to to come to for uh, for heart care. Wow, that's uh, that's absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Absolutely fabulous. So I read a little something <laughs> <laughs> about chocolate. Yes, yes, and, yeah. And possibly wine. Yes, yeah, red wine and chocolate, <laughs> well, alcohol and, and chocolate, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, it's kind of a fun topic to talk about. And a lot of people are interested in it, which is, uh, which well, is, which is nice. Yeah, of course, it gives them permission, Kind of, a, permission, kind of right? a guilty pleasure, that's exactly right. Yes. And, uh, you know, d dark chocolate, you know, 70% or, or higher uh, you know, has are very rich in uh, what's called flavonoids, which are uh, you know uh, big time antioxidant, mm -hmm. which uh, which you know when it's when it's uh, circulating in your bloodstream is very healthy for your blood vessels, and so mm -hmm. uh, you know over time they've done many studies and it seems to be bearing out that you know eating you know a couple of ounces of dark chocolate every day is probably not a bad thing. In fact, I keep. Uh, you, it's funny if you yeah, if you looked at my cupboard, there's always uh, at least four or five bars of dark dark chocolate, and that's kind of my a little bit of my go to snack. You know, it's 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 obviously a lot more bitter than than uh, than milk chocolate. But I bet it tastes great with wine. And that's red wine. Yeah, that, that's you nailed it. That's exactly right. And so uh, red wine is. Uh, and it's funny you'd be hard pressed to find. A uh, heart surgeon that doesn't uh, that doesn't drink some red wine. A lot of cardiologists do too. I know a few that own some vineyards, believe it or not. Oh my gosh! But yeah, they get that into it. But um, yeah. again, same thing there. You know, uh, the flavonoids in in red wine seem to have a protective effect. And so, you know, one or two glasses of red wine in the evening is, uh, is considered, you know, fairly healthy. Obviously, don't don't drive after that. But uh, right, right. But uh, you know, th that's that's it, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but it's it's true. You know, I have to admit, over the years of me doing this, uh, it's funny. You'll see 
uh, you know, I've worked in the deep south before where there, there's a lot of people that smoke and don't drink. And uh, there's a lot of coronary disease there, believe yeah. it or not. And, uh, yeah. you know, I've met, uh, you know, uh, siblings that have, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, obviously genetic similarities. And, you know, you know, one will have uh, a bad coronary disease and doesn't drink. And the other one, you know, has some red wine in the evening and doesn't have any coronary disease. So it's, it's funny, you'll... You'll see that you know, kind of these examples are mm-hmm. they're uh, you know they're they're individual examples, but over time you really do well, get that that yeah uh, that, you get that, that generalization that, that general, that general uh, feeling that yes that yeah. probably a lot of truth to this so. I'm going there out. You go. I'm, yeah, I'm you know stopping at the store. So you need Absolutely. To stop at Whole Foods or Publix on the way home. I'm getting some dark <laughs> chocolate. That's right. That's right. Now that Whole Foods I, is a lot cheaper. Well, you know, I that, already that. have the red wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. So um, I'm just taking a look at some notes here that yes. I, I've been given, and uh, it's it's correct to assume that you treat. The um, heart conditions and lung conditions as well? That's right. Okay, share with us, please. Well, you know, my main uh, focus uh, of interest is doing minimal access uh, uh, open heart surgery, basically. And what we mean by that is making small incisions on the chest rather than, you know, going through the sternum. Uh, really? And so that's kind of my main interest. And we do a lot of uh, valve work that way, or I do, and mm-hmm. a lot of uh, treating arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation that way. And okay. uh, and so, um, you know, working with other cardiologists, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we have a, a, you know, a very specific game plan for each individual patient. And, um, and so, but that's what I really try to focus on. Well, that's really quite state of the art. Now, you do that through a specific type of machine. Well, you know, we you know we use small incisions, and there's a lot of very special equipment that goes with it. Mm-hmm, you know, there's a mm-hmm. there's a small, very specially designed retractors, specially designed instruments. You know, we use a a, a small you know a camera that uh, has a light on the tips oh, and those okay. kind of things. Okay. And so, and there's special. Uh, you know, cannulas that we use uh, to get people on bypass. So there's a lot of, you know, there's, you know, you really have to shift your, your uh, thought process, your mi- mindset when you're doing um, mini access uh, uh, heart surgery versus doing it through a sternotomy, you know. And, uh, you know, yes. the benefits of it is that p- patients uh, don't require uh, as much blood, you know, uh, our, our percent a chance of getting blood after undergoing a, a mini access surgery is much lower than mm-hmm. if you went through a, a, a big open operation. And mm-hmm. and uh, people get out of the hospital a bit faster and uh, they recover faster. And, uh, right. and so those are kind of the and benefits. And it's probably, we it, it, we, I mean, usually what you had seen was that you were opening up the whole chest cavity. Right. Right. And did you have to then open up the the uh, rib cage as well to be able to get to the heart? Well, you know, when you go through the sternum, you just, you know, you, you put a retractor in and, mm-hmm. you know, you're right in the middle of the chest and looking down on the heart. And, you know, when you close that up, you have to put wires in. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes people get infections in those areas. And, and so that's another benefit of doing it through a small access insert, uh, oh, yeah. incision. So that's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very satisfying when you see how well the patients do and, and that they, uh, you know, they're back on their feet pretty quickly. So that, that is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So, and you work with the lungs as well? Yeah. Yeah. We do some uh, okay. lung surgery. So, you know, people that come in with, uh, uh, um, lung tumors, uh, and uh, and uh, plural based diseases is what we call that um, around the lung. Uh, we do surgery for that as well. We try to do them mm-hmm. through small incision surgery as well. So that's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, doctor, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah. Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. Yeah. You know, you can look me up online. That's okay. probably the easiest thing. If you just Google, you know, Eric Beyer, Florida Medical Center. That's spelled B-E-Y-E-R. That's right. E-R-I-K and then B-E-Y-E-R, Florida Medical Center. Okay. And, you know, there's a web page there and it's it has uh, all the information, including, you know, phone numbers and, and contacts and, and those kind and of things. And what insurance you take yeah, yeah. as well. We pretty much take everybody. Uh, oh, good. You know, there was a time where Humana, there was an issue with Humana, but now they're now they're back on board. Are they? Okay. Okay. Good. So we're we're all we're all all squared away. So there's not really a a lot of insurance uh, issues issues there. Great. And what's your telephone number? 
Uh, you uh, you would you would ask that. I have, I'd have to I'd have to look that up. My office number, but you know I'll give people my cell phone number. Believe it or not, as crazy as that sounds, I've yeah. done this before, and I'm going to do it on on the air. Are you but, yeah, okay? Yeah, wait absolutely. a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's set this up. No, this is my cell phone, personal cell phone, personal cell phone. Yeah. I have got to tell you, I have never in my life heard of a doctor giving his personal cell phone. Yeah, yeah, and I've done it to uh, pretty much all the patients I operate on, you know, get my cell phone actually. And uh, wow. yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to do that on on air here. It's 786-202-3531 okay. okay. and uh and then uh, obviously, you know, there's a if I don't answer, you know, if I'm in surgery or something like that, then uh you know, it'll go to an answering service. So okay. you then okay. get all of me that way. Oh my gosh. That that's you know, I, I just want well, to say thank you. Yes, yeah, I love doing ahead. this so much, you know, and I love taking care of patients so much that it's uh, you know, something that that uh that uh, interests me and we love talking to uh, to, to patients as well. So Oh get their my, problems fixed. Oh my and goodness! And if we can't do it, we'll get them in the right direction. Well, that is absolutely wonderful. I'm like totally amazed. Yeah. You know, thank you all, County Healthcare, for sponsoring this show so that we can bring on these type of doctors for you. Because I've got to tell you, there's nothing better than someone, first of all, giving out their cell phone, their personal cell phone, but that cares so much about the well-being of his patients and the things that he can help with. And also, you know, even if you're not the right fit or you need something different, he'll, he would be there yeah, to we, help we you as well. Many, many doctors in our network uh, that, uh, like I said, whether it's a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist or interventional cardiologist or a structural heart cardiologist. There's a lot of options out there and wow. uh, get you moved in the right direction. That's for sure. That is, that's incredible. Well, thank you for that. Anytime. Now, I was also, there's, there's a procedure called the maze procedure m-a-z-e yeah. yes can you explain that to us yeah that's a great question uh i don't know if we have enough time to explain it but i i or give I, us a, a, i've um, given the synopsis so many times in my life i think i can probably uh break it down you know atrial fibrillation is the disease process we're treating uh, with the maze procedure okay and uh, uh so there's a lot of people out there with atrial fibrillation and Describe that just a little bit, just in case our audience might be experiencing that and they don't yeah. know yeah, what I'll, it is. Yeah, I'll describe that to you. In, in fact, I have a YouTube channel that, you know, if you ever wanted to look at some of the surgery videos that we do, including the maze procedure uh, is on there, and I'm constantly updating it. So, uh, you know, you can subscribe to that YouTube channel. But, um, but uh, uh, what it is is AFib is when the heart is not in sync rhythm-wise. Oh, okay. And uh, so people will sometimes will experience it as a very fast heart rate with a lot of you know deep palpitations. Some people may not notice at all that they're in AFib and they're just kind of chronically fatigued and short of breath and dizzy. And uh, then of course, uh, the worst thing that can happen to you when, you're, when you have AFib is that you, ha you have a stroke mm -hmm. and, uh, and you didn't know you were in AFib until you've had that stroke. And so AFib is when the top two chambers of the heart quiver. They just quiver. They don't, there's not a coordinated beat, you know. Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. You know that they should be coordinated. You know, it should con everything should contract in unison and relax. And AFib, the two upper chambers are just kind of quivering, and then that sends some weird signals to the lower chambers of the heart, the ventricle, and so people will get these weird, you know, irregular beats. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way we treat it is by addressing the atrium, obviously the two upper chambers of the heart. Right. And we go in, and there are a lot of options, and it's very confusing. If you were to go ever to go online, I mean, I imagine it would be very, very uh, confusing world uh, because uh, cardiologists can treat this, and uh, the surgeons okay. can treat it. And typically, okay. uh, the electrophysiologists like Dr. Kenningsberg, the the one electrophysiologist I mentioned, or Dr. Nayari. They are the ones that kind of address this problem initially, mm -hmm. and if they if they have trouble uh, treating it, uh, then they they would approach me, and mm -hmm. uh, and then and then we have a uh, a way of fixing it, which is the maze procedure. Oh, okay, and uh, it's the gold standard of treating this problem. Uh, there was a gentleman named Jimmy Cox out of St. Louis. Uh, he's retired now. Uh, he designed this procedure in the lab, basically, and then he started doing it on patients, and they found that he was getting awesome results. You know, he was curing mm. atrial fibrillation. Wow. So, um, but it was a very difficult procedure to do, and you had to go through the sternum, and so not a lot of people, you know, ended up doing that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, over the years, over the decades, we have uh, figured out kind of maybe where to pinpoint the disease, uh, and sometimes uh, it's not, it's not, you know, you have to undergo the, the maze and we've, we have new devices now that we can go through small access 
uh, like I was talking about incisions. Oh, yeah. And uh, and and what we do is we kind of create a maze on the heart. Believe it or not, we create um, um, scars on the atrium so that the electrical uh, impulse will follow that maze. Believe it or not, yeah. Really? And that's that's why they call it the maze procedure, because it because you know you know when you if you were to draw it out, it almost looks like a maze. And uh, and so and a lot of people have added Jimmy Cox's name to it, so they got the Cox Maze procedure, and so that's that's why it's called that, you know. And uh, it, and there's a lot of iterations of it, so it can be a very confusing world for for patients that have AFib. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, and 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 very much scary too. That's I would right. imagine. That's right. That's right. Because sometimes you just don't know what in the world is going on and why this is happening, and. It, yeah, it can be a little. Oh yeah, it can be daunting. It can be daunting, no doubt about it. Well, and what is September then? Also, I know what is September. September, <laughs> it's atrial fibrillation awareness month. Is that right? Yes. I did not know that. They keep coming up with these things. I know. I know. Uh, the, you know, the heart disease month is February, but I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's actually interesting. I operated on a lady, and I'm sure she doesn't mind uh, me telling you. Her name's Melanie Truehills. And she started uh, a website called stopafib.org. Oh, and that's okay. a great resource, actually, to go to. But I actually operate on her, uh, I think it's over 10 years now ago. And she's been in normal rhythm ever since. And wow. uh, and, uh, and she, she was so excited about it, she actually... St- started a uh, website and uh, and is on fabulous. speaker bureaus everywhere, and uh, she's got some great resources there too. It sounds like yeah, you've got your own PR person well, I there. Do, huh? I do, yeah, I do, I do indeed. You know, so uh, yeah, look, I look that up. <laughs> that is great. Now, uh, give us a little bit of information about the hybrid. Uh, convergent procedure. Yeah, again, this is where I was saying it gets a little confusing. Okay. Uh, there's there there the Cox maze is uh, is a procedure that you know we tailor sometimes to some patients, and then there's another procedure called the convergent procedure where okay. it's a combination of of the electrophysiologist and the surgeon doing the procedure. Mm-hmm. And basically, we you know this this is a. Uh, this is a uh, hybrid approach to treating this problem and uh, ad- addressing uh, issues uh, with AFib. And it has a fairly high success rate, too. It's not as high as the Cox maze for, but it's it's a little less traumatic to patients. And so we're, we're trading off, you know, um, you know uh, uh, success for less trauma to the patient mm-hmm. and, and faster recovery time. But, you know, we're starting to see very good results with this. And so basically there's a, you know, small incision that's made underneath the sternum. Oh, okay. And we go in and uh, and ablate uh, uh, or cause the scar tissue to the back wall of the atrium, which is uh, where a lot of the AFib seems to be generated from. And so that's okay. another way to treat this uh, issue too. And again, you know, we tailor the procedure individually to the to the patients. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's great to know. That's an important thing. You want somebody that can do everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and we uh they you know, we go from, you know, just just uh transcatheter ablation all the way to doing the Cox maze four through small access surgery. So we we have the whole gambit. Uh, that is awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I've got to tell you, it, it has been a pleasure. I, I'm just double checking here and make sure that I've oh, I know what else I want to ask you about. <laughs> uh VATS. V A T S. What does that, that stand for? That stands for, for uh, video assisted thoroscopic surgery. So that's that's uh, also the, what we're talking about doing small access surgery on the lung. So the it's lung. with a video okay. video video scope, you know, uh-huh. and it's assisting you to do the uh, the the surgery on the lung, and so that allows us to do smaller incisions. Uh, and uh, you know, we can even remove lobes of the lung through through these kind of wow. small incisions. Uh, for you know, lung cancer, lung tu- lung tumors. Ooh, yeah. goodness! So, give our audience some um, preventive ideas on what to do, what not to do when it comes to your heart. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, the biggest thing I think you could do is don't smoke. You know, I hate to yeah. say it, but uh, you know, I know a lot of people are out there that that uh, are uh, you know they. They they really enjoy their cigarettes, and I and I tell people, I you know I don't I'm, I'm, I don't try to lecture smokers because it, it really doesn't go anywhere uh, lecturing people. I think it's it's about giving them uh, you know knowledge and, and understanding right. about right. you know what they're doing to their health, 
And, um, you know, and to be honest with you, my, my mother smoked in the past, my dad smoked in the past, you know, back in the, in the seventies, it was quite fashionable, I think, to, to and the smoke. 60s. And the sixties for sure. Yes. And, uh, and I, I even remember seeing some commercials where some doctors were, were <laughs> saying, you know, after surgery, they like to have a smoke, you know? Yeah. And so, but what, you know, what we realized over time, uh, and Michael DeBakey actually, uh, who's now, you know, he's long, yeah, one of the famous heart surgeons from, uh, Houston, uh, who's no longer with us, obviously, but uh, he he was the one that helped uh, figure out that uh, that uh, that uh, lung cancer uh, came from smoking. But mm. also, we found out since then, you know, peripheral vascular disease, uh, coronary artery disease, carotid artery disease, all of that is certainly uh, you know aneurysms of the abdominal aorta, thoracic aorta. All those are certainly related to uh, smoking. And so, wow. and so, it's important to, to realize that that's very important not to. Getting, yeah. getting some exercise, even if it's just getting out to walk, you know, 10, mm -hmm. 15 minutes a day is a good idea. And and, and try Absolutely. to eat those antioxidants that we talked about. And they're in yes. a lot of foods. They're in uh, vegetables. They're in, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, some fruits. And uh, and so that's why it's important. You chocolate, want, you, dark yeah, chocolate. Yeah, dark chocolate. Well, you <laughs> want to kind of bombard your body through the day with uh, with these antioxidants. I mm -hmm. think they're very helpful. Um, you know, and so that, I think that's, uh, you know, how you eat and, you know, exercise and try not to smoke, I think would be the uh, most important thing. You know, and I, I just want to ask a little bit more because, you know, the big thing now is vaping. Yeah. What do you see versus regular yeah, cigarettes you know, versus I, vaping? I, I, you know, I think the jury's out on that. Uh, you know, my general impression is that it, if, if you had to pick one, you know, if you're forced to pick one, I think vaping probably probably would end up being better, but you know I don't know. Maybe in ten years' time, I'll I'll look back at this uh, conversation and say, "Well, I was wrong." <laughs> but uh, I think it's 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 still it's just not it's it's not, it's um, not well understood. Well, that's and, true. And and yeah. uh, and, um, and we don't have the results yet of you know because that people haven't been vaping that long, and uh, mm -hmm. you know time will tell. You know how how bad it is, but I I, I probably you know, would err on the side of caution there and just avoid, uh, you know, being just addicted to nicotine. You know? <laughs> yeah. Nicotine is extremely addictive. There's no it doubt is. about it. And and, yes. it. and it's very pleasing to your mind. That's why people do it. They don't do it because, right. you know, they're, you know, they're wanting to make their family members mad. They're doing it because it relaxes them and it gives them a, you know, sense of ease and peace. And, uh, and, uh, and so there, there's a very strong addiction, uh, uh, component to this, obviously, Right. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, understanding that and understanding, uh, you know, your, your, you know, the, the weakness, uh, 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 to that is, is important part of learning how to, uh, to stop smoking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching, uh, uh, um, um, uh, house of cards, uh, you know, I was catching up, well, you know, that, that show, uh, -huh, uh yeah, with, yeah. Uh, have you ever watched it? There? Uh, it's, a it's, little, it's, bit, little bit, yes. yeah, they, and, uh, and, uh, Kevin Spacey's always, you know, he's a politician in there and. They would they also have a smoke at the end of the evening and uh, relax, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, you can really get in the mindset of a smoker, you know, and and uh, understand why they do that. And uh, yeah, it's but it's 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 killing you, literally killing you. It so, is. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, I yeah. cannot thank you enough for being on our show tonight because yeah. I do know how busy you are and that you took time out to come and help educate us, teach us about your particular expertise. Yeah, it's my uh, pleasure. Absolutely uh, my pleasure. For which I've heard you're the greatest at. Yeah. <laughs> okay? And if you, you want to get a hold of Dr. Bayer, please give him a call at FMC or go on the website at FMC and ask for him. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you can always call All County Healthcare. Uh, ask for Maddie, and she's at 888-717-7170, and she'll put you in touch with the doctor as well. So thank you again for being here. We so appreciate it. Thanks. And we're going to go on a commercial. Stay tuned. Do not leave. we got another doctor coming. County Healthcare Inc. is locally owned and operated, serving the Tri County area, Palm Beach, Dade, and Broward counties for the last 25 years. The practice of medicine is changing dramatically. All County Healthcare Inc. still does it the old fashioned way, where our nurses and healthcare professionals come into your home to service your medical needs, providing you the fastest and best care possible. For more information, call 954 717 7027. And remember, Medicare Home Care is covered by Part A of Medicare with no out-of-pocket cost to you. It's your decision and only your decision 
on what health care agency you use. Call today. All County Home Health Care, Inc. at 954-717-7027. License 200-99096. Getting older is not for sissies. That's what one of my patients says. And it's funny, but it's true. Live long enough and you'll get arthritis, skin cancer, probably one of the common chronic diseases like CHF, COPD, diabetes. At Old County Healthcare, we teach you how to manage your disease. We make sure you know how to take your medications and how to recognize signs and symptoms before requiring hospitalization, no matter how many visits it takes. You didn't move to Florida to be sick. You moved here to enjoy the rest of your life. And that's exactly what our team of nurses, therapists, and aides at All County Healthcare help you do. You are listening to You and Your Doctor, Living Longer and Healthier, an informative show that helps you find answers to questions you always wanted to ask but did not have that somebody that could make a difference in your life. Call into the show if you have a question at 888-565-1470, and we will put you on the air to inform all our listeners. Now, back to our show. Hi, welcome back to You and Your Doctor, where we're teaching you how to live a healthier and longer life. And just a little note out to our uh, friends in Texas, we send prayers and thoughts to you and speedy recovery, hoping that everything uh, gets cleaned up real quick and you'll, you have the ability of getting back on your feet and back to living life the way you knew it to be. So we're here with another wonderful doctor. He happens to be a plastic surgeon. His name is Dr. Hilton Becker. And uh, he's got some very, very interesting uh, information for us. So welcome, Dr. Becker. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking time out and being with us. My pleasure. So tell me, where <clears throat> did you? when did you decide that uh, being a doctor was something in your blood, that you had a passion for it? Well, I've always been interested in um, physical things, mechanics. I did physics and chemistry in pre-med, and I was leaning towards engineering. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, engineering of the, yeah, of the body. <laughs> exactly. So um, I started medicine, and I realized that there was quite a lot of engineering in medicine, especially in surgery. Mm. So I drifted into surgery. Then I saw what the plastic surgeons were doing, and I thought, that's just for me. Excellent. So I started plastic surgery. So, uh, and where did you do your schooling? Well, I, I trained in South Africa. I did my basic oh. medical training there. I was hearing so, an accent, yes, yes. so that's why I was wondering. Yeah. So I did my basic medical training in South Africa. I did my general surgery and my plastic surgery. I then did a second residency in the United States oh. at the Medical College of Virginia. So I've done two plastic surgery residencies. Excellent. Yeah. Wow, that's fabulous. Well, it, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and you were saying that you've seen some remarkable things happening in plastic surgery. Yeah. Um, give us a little bit of an idea. Uh, first of all, what it used to be, and, and then its evolution. Well, I think there's several areas I can describe. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest things we've seen is now in the era of minimally invasive surgery. Ah, yes. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. When I started my training, if a young girl came in for a breast reduction, for example, mm -hmm. she would have been admitted to the hospital a day before surgery. She would have been typed and cross-matched for two units of blood. Mm. Uh, she would have had four to six hours of surgery. Oh, my goodness. She would goodness. have stayed in hospital for three to four days. She would have had massive scarring, what we call the anchor scar. Right, I'm right familiar. Right around all the way horizontal. Mm -hmm. Today, a breast reduction is done under twilight anesthesia. The patient goes home the same day. The scars are very minimal. It, the, they can be what we call the lollipop scar. Okay. Uh, with, which looks like a lollipop. Right. Sometimes even just a circular scar. Wow. So totally, totally different. And the surgery time is two hours compared oh. to four to six. Oh, my goodness. So, That's huge. Yeah. That's and quite a... very little bleeding, very little loss of blood. 
Mm-hmm. Another area which I do a lot of work in is in breast reconstruction. Okay. Breast reconstruction, when I was a general surgery resident, breast reconstruction was not done. Surgeons were doing radical mastectomies. They oh, were goodness. literally mutilating the patients, cutting oh. off the whole breast, cutting off the muscle, putting on a skin flap, and there was no reconstruction done. Wow. Today, we can do a breast reconstruction where we save the, the whole nipple areola complex. Mm-hmm. We can put the scar underneath the breast where it's hidden. Mm-hmm. The patient can have a mastectomy and a reconstruction all done in one operation where the patient can come out looking better than she did before the mastectomy. Oh, my goodness. So, major, major change. That is major. <laughs> right. That that's, am- that's absolutely amazing. And especially with the uh, breast reduction, yeah. because there are so many women out there that, that unfortunately... Are, are very overdeveloped and and it just is is so difficult for them you know back aches neck aches uh, uh, where the bra is digging into their exactly. shoulder mm-hmm. and and I would imagine that that this kind of re- reconstruction is just absolutely fabulous for them yeah. well patients who've had a breast reduction often say they feel like a bird that's been let out of a cage they can now fly. <laughs> <laughs> Literally fly. Because, I mean, oh. could you imagine walking around with two watermelons tied around your neck? Oh, my God. And women suffer through life like that. Yes. Where today it's not necessary. Oh, that's, that yeah. is so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been in practice? Thirty, uh, Just over 30 years. Really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so you have seen a lot of the seen evolution. Yes. Mm-hmm. My mm-hmm. goodness. So on reconstruction um, for cancer patients, explain to us... You know what some of the procedures are. Um, give us some insight as to what is available for them, especially if they have to lose all of the breast tissue. Yeah. Well, the several procedures available. Uh, you can use your own tissue, which is called autologous reconstruction. That involves moving tissue from one part of the body to another. Uh, it can be done as a flap where the tissues are attached or it can be done as what's called a free flap where the tissue is actually cut off and the vessels are re-anastomosed. Tissue can be taken from the abdomen, from the buttock, from the thigh, etc. Uh-huh. Okay. That's a fairly big operation, yeah. but, el- but it eliminates the need for a prosthesis. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you can use a prosthesis. The way I do it is I use an adjustable breast implant that is placed initially underfold or even empty if necessary so that the patient has a mastectomy immediately after the mastectomy it looks like no reconstruction was done because we wait for the circulation to pick up make sure that the wound's going to heal and then we fill the implant after surgery with saline injections oh okay another change is that we now put the implant above the muscle instead of below Oh. And I do that for all my breast surgeries today, including cosmetic breast augmentation and the reconstructions. Because if an implant is placed beneath the muscle, patients get what's called animation deformity. When they contract the muscle, the implant distorts and moves. Right. It also causes pressure and pain. We've learned over the years that if we put the implant above the muscle, they don't have this animation deformity they, they don't have the pain, they don't have the discomfort. Hmm. So I do a lot of revision cases on patients who in the past, either augmentation or reconstruction, have had the implants under the muscle, we convert them to above the muscle. That's really yeah. interesting because I remember when they first came out, it was above the muscle. Yes. And then it made a very strange indentation in the chest cavity, uh, especially when you know you would have a level of cleavage, um, so it left like an indentation. So you're able to come away from that. Well, well what you said initially, it was above the muscle, mm-hmm. and then they moved to behind the muscle because they thought it was safer and would reduce the incidence of capsular contracture. Mm-hmm. They've now found that if you go above the muscle, as long as you elevate. The layer of the muscle that's called the fascia, which is the lining of the muscle, Mm -hmm. if you elevate that, that gives you sufficient support for the implant. Ah. You don't need to go under the muscle. Now, another thing we do in breast reconstruction today is if we don't have a thick enough coverage over the implant, Mm -hmm. instead of going under the muscle, we inject fat into the skin flap. 
Wow. So we harvest fat from the abdomen uh, and inject the fat. There have been some major advances in fat injection. Fat injection is not yes, really new. Yes, tell us about that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's been done for a long time, but over the years we've learned how to improve this technique. For example, what we've learned is uh, when you harvest fat, you break some of the fat cells down. The fat right. liberates oil and you have dead cell components. Right. And this okay. interferes with the survival of the fat. So if you can clean the fat very well, get rid of the oil, get rid of the dead cells, the fat will survive better. We've also learned how to harvest the fat less traumatically, how to inject it less traumatically. And what I'm doing today is I'm using PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Okay. And what platelet-rich plasma is, it's blood that we harvest from the patient. Mm -hmm. We take out the red cells and we concentrate the platelets. The platelets have the growth factors which stimulates the tissue and helps it survive and also stimulates collagen formation. Ah. Fat cells also have what's called stromal vascular fraction, which is the connective tissue of the fat. So we've learned today how to harvest that portion of the fat, which contains the stromal vascular fraction, which also contains the stem cells. Excellent. So the stem cells are the rejuvenating cells. Right, right. So when you inject stem cells, for example, into the face, it rejuvenates the skin. Mm -hmm. So we can harvest fat, we can concentrate the stem cells, we can concentrate the platelets now injected into the face, uh, often taking place of a facelift. And in the face, we can inject the forehead, the upper lids, the cheeks, the chin, the whole mm -hmm. face. So we're doing much less facelift surgery compared to what we were doing in the past. We're doing filling surgery. So yeah, I've drifted was. off the breast reconstruction no, no, no. for a moment. But, but, but that's all good right. knowledge. That's, uh, that's amazing knowledge. So coming back to the breast reconstruction, right. now okay. with the tools of the stem cells and the, and, and the PRP, mm -hmm. we can enhance our fat survival. So we can thicken the flaps with less need to bring flaps in from other areas of the body we can thicken the, the flap that is left behind uh -huh. by the general surgeon, which makes the reconstruction much easier. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Yeah. I love hearing about that. <laughs> That's incredible. Now, with the fat harvesting, um, is, is, is it just a, a clump or do you mold the, the fat or how does that work? Well, the harvesting is done exactly the same way as liposuction. Okay. So... We do liposuction, mm -hmm. but instead of throwing the fat away, we save the fat. I always say fat is a terrible thing to waste <laughs> because it is so useful in the body. Instead of throwing it away, you can salvage it and utilize the various components in the fat uh -huh. to do a whole lot of things. I told you with the face, yes, uh, we can inject it in the breast, even in a patient's having a breast augmentation to give a better contour, a better shape. And does the fat stay then in that the space? The fat stays where we inject it. Wow. The fat is injected with a syringe, just with mm -hmm. a needle. The same as the various fillers, you know, like Restylane oh, or yes. Radies. You yes. can put fat into a 1cc syringe and inject it very much the same way. So you can rejuvenate the face. You can fill the breasts. You can even, in certain patients, you don't even need to do a breast implant. You can get a small breast just with fat injections alone. That is yeah. amazing. That is yeah. really incredible. Mm. And what's, the, I mean, so the fat stays in that particular yes. area that you put it in, and um, does it ever go away? No. Or Because sometimes, you know, when I know when I'm losing weight, the fat goes away. <laughs> when I gain weight, the fat comes back. So right. the, we I, like to get the fat from the areas where it doesn't go away. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's the hip roll. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the saddle abdomen. bags. The yep. saddle bags and the abdomen. Yes. So yes. we salvage the fat that really doesn't go away. Now the fat doesn't all survive, so you may need to have it repeated. Okay. Uh, maybe a few times until you get the desired effect. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And, you know, I've also heard of the fat being injected into the buttocks as well. Exactly. To plump that back up yes. again. Yes, exactly. You can. So if a woman has a lot of excess fat on the abdomen, mm -hmm. you can harvest that fat, inject it into the buttock. 
Yeah. Love that. <laughs> now, uh, do you have to allow it to sit for a while while it is being harvested, or can it go right back in? No, the sooner you get it back, the better. Okay. Because remember, the fat that is injected has now lost its blood supply. Uh-huh. So the, f- the fat, provided it's a small enough particle, will be able to, s- to survive for a while through the, the body fluids that it's <laughs> sitting in. Mm-hmm. And then blood vessels will slowly grow into the fat to renourish it. That's where the PRP comes in. The PRP has factors that stimulate blood growth called angioplastic growth factors. Okay. Stimulates the blood cell, the blood vessels to grow back into the fat and keep it alive. Wow, that is mm-hmm. very fascinating. Yeah. And that's great to hear because, you know, what I've heard... A lot of times, you know, when uh, you go in for the injectables, yeah, you're right. It's just like Gervaderm or or, uh, Restylane or um, the the various fillers, and and now you're using the PRP along with that, and then it's. I know a question: Is it better to use the injectables with the PRP or the fat? Uh, rejuvenation in the face or do you use that in combination well I give the patients the option Mm -hmm. of course the off the shelf injectables you just pick up the syringe and inject and it's done Mm -hmm. the fat you've got to harvest the fat so it's an extra procedure for the patient you've got to numb up the area you then got to aspirate the fat you got to process it you got to get the PRP and mix it with the fat and inject it Mm -hmm. so it's a more timely uh, um, procedure takes more effort to do. It's not just taking a syringe and injecting it. Gotcha, gotcha. But the other thing is that most of the injectables are not permanent. Now there are That's some, what I was right. going to say now, too. Yeah. There are some permanent ones, but people are reluctant to use the permanent because what if they don't like it? The permanent ones are difficult to then remove. Right. Now the fat, it, the fat is permanent but it's natural tissue. It's not a foreign body sitting in there Mm. like silicone. Silicone injections are permanent. Mm -hmm. But if you don't like it, it's difficult to get rid of and it's a foreign body. Right. That's fascinating information. That is wonderful. So even with um, breast augmentation, you can use your own fat cells as well. Correct. So as I said, you can create a, a breast with no implant but a limited size, you can't right. make it very big. But what we also do when we do an implant, sometimes, as you mentioned, you have an irregular surface on the implant or a dent. Right. So you can combine the fat injections with the implant, which gives a very nice, natural, smooth shape to the breast. Um, wow, that's, that's fabulous. Because I re- do remember way back when they first uh, were introduced yeah. and how um, there was, as you said, the dent in, in the breast yeah. area and, and that's how you almost always knew or they were as hard as rocks correct that, that was another thing yes. well that was another thing because the old silicone implants used to leak silicone silicone yeah. oil and the silicone oil caused an inflammatory reaction which caused what's called capsular contracture that's hardening around the implants Okay, great. And I was going to ask you to explain that to us because right. some, I, some of the audience members not might not understand what the capsular, yeah, uh, um, is that that you can explain. Right. Well, yeah. capsular contracture is not the implant; okay. it's the body's reaction, right. usually to an irritant around the implant. Now, it could be the silicone that oozes out of the implant, mm-hmm. or it could be low-grade infection. Now, the old implant, which had the silicone oozing out, has now been replaced by what's called a cohesive gel, and it looks like a gummy bear. So some people call it the gummy bear implant. Ah. So this is a semi, almost a semi-solid implant. Mm -hmm. So there's minimal oozing, virtually no oozing out of this implant, so you don't get as much capsular contracture as we used to see in the past. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Yeah. So, and uh, the other thing too, it, um, that there was a lot of uh, lawsuits that came about because of the silicone leaking within the body. Correct. Um, do you see any more of that happening? At, 
No. no, because they've now changed it to the cohesive gel, the gummy bear. Okay. And also all these alleged illnesses that silicone was supposed to cause, uh, medical literature has refuted wow. most of that. I mean, there's, there's no real evidence that silicone causes these autoimmune diseases. Because silicone That's is actually... That's very interesting. You know, silicone is found in a lot of things. Every syringe is lubricated with silicone. The plunger, mm. the needles are lubricated or coated with silicone. A lot of other implants are silicone. Uh, the doctor you just had on with the pacemakers, the pacemakers are coated with silicone. Brain shunts are silicone. A lot of joints are silicone. That's very interesting. So I did not know that. And the FDA has approved silicone injections into the face. So well, silicone is very, very non-reactive in the body. Okay. But having said that, we do still have saline implants, and a lot of patients want and like saline implants. There is a new saline implant out at the moment, which I'm using as well. It's called the Ideal Implant. Mm. And what it is, it's a saline implant that has extra chambers within, made out of solid silicone. So the, the, an implant is made out of a shell. So right. they've put extra shells inside the shell, which baffles the saline. So it's oh, almost like the old okay. water beds. You remember yes, the old yes, water yes. beds were Ripley and they put foam inside? Yes. So this is similar. So we now have a saline implant that feels more like a silicone gel implant. Uh, so for patients that don't want silicone yeah. and are reluctant to have saline, they can have this new implant, which so far I've used quite a few of them and they look very encouraging. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to ask you the difference between those two. Um, I had somebody tell me that they had saline implants and it was almost like you could hear the water swishing. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And I'm like, uh-oh. Or another one I ended up bursting. Yes, <laughs> and, and then, then it suddenly had, goes flat. Yeah, right. a, like a flat tire almost. Right, right. So, so that's why these newest uh, saline implants are very encouraging because they have the multiple chambers... Uh, they have less squishing of the saline, mm -hmm. they feel more like silicone and less likelihood to, to leak suddenly. That's, that's yeah. incredible. So if you're doing reconstruction and you're using this, the saline adjustable implant, implant the, yes. the adjustable, um, do you recommend that after they reach that particular size that they're looking for, that they swap out for well, a different... Well, that's the beauty of the adjustable implant. They don't have to. The oh. adjustable implant has a little filling port attached to it, mm -hmm. which is buried under the skin, and that's how you access it. Mm -hmm. A needle goes through the skin into the port so you can increase or decrease the size to where you want it. Once you've reached the right size, a small incision is made over the injection port. Mm -hmm. The injection port is removed with one or two little stitches, and then the patient is done. But at that stage, she has a saline implant. Gotcha. Now, if That's her tissues are very thin and she has some rippling, mm -hmm. she can switch it out to a silicone implant instead okay. of the saline. Okay. So she's not committed to the saline, mm -hmm. but she's not committed to having to remove it like a tissue expander. If yes. a patient uses a tissue expander, that has to come out. It You're cannot right. stay in. It can't stay in. Right. Yes, yes. Um, with that being said, also... Uh, with those uh, individuals that are that have the ports and and the saline implants, um, do you find that a lot of times as the age goes on and the skin starts to stretch even more, that it's very easy to uh, put more water or more saline into the implant? Or? Well, no, with the adjustable, once you pull the injection port out. Uh huh. You cannot put more in. Okay. That's it. Okay. But you brought up an interesting point. As women get older, mm -hmm. they now don't want their implants anymore. Mm, really? Yeah. So we see older women who come in and they say, you know, I've had my implants for 30 years. I'm tired of them. They've got a little firm. I want them out. What can I do? Wow. So they have quite a few choices today. It's not just rip the implant out and leave them with skin bags that are just hanging. Right, right. We can take the implants out. We can inject what's remaining with fat oh. and leave them with a small, normal, natural breast without an implant. Uh -huh. We can rearrange the tissues, bring in tissues from the side and from the bottom to give more fullness even without an implant. Or we can do what we call a mastopexy, a breast lift. So we can take oh, okay. the remaining tissues rearrange it, give them a smaller, 
lifted breast. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when they remove the implants, they're not left deformed. That's what I was wondering because, you know, you're right. As we start aging, you know, that skin begins to continue to stretch. Stretch and say, and, yeah. Yes, and, uh, and, and also with aging, you know, the skin is not elastic anymore. Right. So it really doesn't bounce back the way that it would normally, right. you know, bounce back when you were younger. Exactly. So that's that's very yeah. interesting. That's good to know. <laughs> but I'm surprised that a lot of the older uh, women would prefer to remove the implant and not have it any longer. Yeah. Well, especially the ones who've had the older implants that have become oh, yeah. hard yes. and firm. They want them out. But, um, you know, the other thing with a lot of women, as they get older, their breasts get bigger. And now they've got the implant and the increase in size and they want oh. to be smaller. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing a, a breast reduction, we just take the implants out, rearrange the tissue, and they look much better. Now, one final question. Does insurance pay for the fat uh, injections if you're uh, doing reconstruction of? Yes. Okay. Insurance will pay for breast reconstruction after a mastectomy. Okay. Irrespective of what technique you use. If you're going to use fat injections or a tissue expander, or a flap, or an implant, Mm -hmm. or even a revision. If you have a complication, or you have asymmetry, they will also pay for a symmetry procedure of the opposite breast. For example, if a woman has a mastectomy, Mm -hmm. she has a very large breast on the other side, they will pay for the reduction on the other side, or even a lift on the other side. Wow, well, that's great to know. Yeah. That's great to know. It has been an absolute pleasure. How yes, do yes. people get a hold of you, Dr. Becker? Well, they can reach me at my website. Okay. www.beckermd.com. Okay. They can call me on my phone, 561-394-6656. Okay, now one more time and just a little slower in case they're running for a pen okay. and paper. 561-394-6656. Okay. They can also call West Boca Medical Center, who will give them my phone number or my website. My website is www.beckermd.com. Okay, that sounds great. And if you do have any questions for Dr. Becker, you can also call All County Healthcare, ask for Maddie. That telephone number is 888-717-7170, and she'll put you in contact with the doctor. Well, it has been absolutely wonderful to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you so very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to see you. And, okay. uh, and that's all for this uh, show on Tuesday, the 29th of August. We look forward to seeing you next week, Tuesday, from the hours of 6 to 7. I'm Lorena Anderson. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for letting us share with you a longer and healthier lifestyle. If you have a doctor or are a doctor and wish to be on the show, call Amp2TV at 866-244-5422 and we will put you on the air as soon as possible. Tune in next week for more information on living longer and having a healthier life. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors.